risk factors. For carcinoma stomach, first, nutritional. Low fat or low protein intake. Second, high complex carbohydrate intake. Increased nitrate intake or increased intake of nitrates and consumption of salted meat. This increases the risk of carcinoma stomach. Second, social. It is seen in low socioeconomic status. Third, environmental. Smoking. Lack of refrigeration. Use of well water. These are environmental factors. Fourth, medical. Medical factors. History of gastrectomy. Partial gastrectomy. H. pylori infection. Epstein-Barr virus infection. Adenomatous polyp, chronic atrophic gastritis, and menetrius disease. These are medical factors. After that, occupational, rubber and coal workers, rubber and coal workers. After that, genetic factors, first, Male gender, second, blood group A, HNPCC, hereditary non polyposis colon cancer, and Leaf Ramini syndrome. And pernicious anemia. So these are the risk factors for carcinoma stomach. Be careful, alcohol is not a risk factor for carcinoma stomach. So alcohol is not a risk factor. After that, there are certain factors which are protective. So what are protective factors? Sizac is protective. Sizac, selenium, iron, zinc, aspirin, vitamin A, calcium, and vitamin C. 
So selenium, iron, zinc, aspirin, vitamin A, calcium, vitamin C, all these are protective factors for carcinoma stomach. There are two important classification systems for carcinoma stomach. One is Bormann's classification and one is Lorenz classification. Now see this Bormann's classification. This is pathological classification based on macroscopic appearance. So Bormann's classification type 1. This is diffuse polypoidal growth. Diffuse polypoidal growth. After that, type 2. Ulcerated lesions with raised borders or elevated borders. Type 3. Ulcerated lesion. Infiltrating the gastric wall. Infiltrating the gastric wall. Type 4 is Linitis plastica. And type 5 is non classifiable. This is Bormann's classification based on macroscopic appearance. There is very important classification which is frequently asked nowadays and that is Lorenz classification. So have a look. What is Lorenz classification? Lorenz classification divides carcinoma stomach in two types. First, intestinal and second is diffuse intestinal and diffuse variety now see how to remember this it's very easy generally you have to remember that intestinal variety is classical variety classical variety means the kind of carcinoma stomach which you know and diffuse variety is atypical variety the kind of carcinoma stomach which you don't know now the classical variety is generally more common in males, more common in elderly, most common site is distal part. Whereas, this diffuse variety which is atypical is more common in females seen in young patients and most common site is what? Fundus or proximal part. So, how to remember? Intestinal variety is the classical variety and diffuse variety is atypical variety. So, have a look. Intestinal variety here. Environmental risk factors. There is environmental risk factor, and here there is familial risk factor. Obviously, it is more common in males, it is more common in females, it is seen in fifth to sixth decade. And this one is more common in young patients. Here, the most common site is distal part. Here, the most common site is proximal part. In this case, there is well defined gland formation. In this case, there is poor gland formation. And specially, signet ring variety is seen. In this case, there is hematogenous spread. And in this case, there is lymphatic or transmural spread. 
there are similarities also what are the similarities in both there is p16 and p53 mutation which is common in both which one is the characteristic mutation in intestinal variety there is apc gene mutation and there is micro satellite instability also but in this case there is decreased e catherine be careful this question is frequently asked decreased e catherine this one is epidemic and this one is endemic means clustered in certain regions so these are the differences between intestinal variety and diffuse variety and here you can see what intestinal variety is the classical variety and diffuse variety is a typical variety now we are going to discuss carcinoma stomach in detail first question maximum incidence of carcinoma stomach is seen in which country japan so there is maximum incidence of carcinoma stomach in japan it is usually more common in males it is usually seen in 6th decade question is asked most common site of carcinoma stomach is antrum and be careful most common site of carcinoma stomach in pernicious anemia most common site of carcinoma stomach in pernicious anemia be careful it's fundus and i told you from esophagus till rectum any malignancy having hematogenous spread what's the most common site of metastasis that's liver so most common site of metastasis is liver and you already told me the chemotherapy regimen which is same for carcinoma esophagus and carcinoma stomach and that is what ecf what's that apirubicin cisplatin and 5 fluorouracil it is same for carcinoma stomach and carcinoma esophagus so these are the questions about carcinoma stomach now see what is the presentation of carcinoma stomach since the most common location of this malignancy is what can you see antrum and because of this antrum can you see this malignancy because of this there is obstruction that's why most common symptom is abdominal pain followed by weight loss now see the problem sometimes this malignancy is there where at the g junction if malignancy is close to g junction what is the most common symptom for g junction tumors for g junction tumors most common symptom is dysphagia and now there is a trend what is the trend nowadays malignancy is concentrating at g junction why worldwide the squamous cell carcinoma of esophagus is decreasing and adenocarcinoma of esophagus is increasing in stomach distal malignancies are decreasing and proximal malignancies are increasing it means nowadays malignancies are concentrating at g junction and we have a separate classification also for g junction tumors and what's the name of that classification it's known as c word classification so there is a separate classification c word classification for g junction tumors third situation some patients are having linnitus plastica what is other name of linnitus plastica it is also known as leather bottle stomach so it is also known as 
leather bottle stomach. What is the most common symptom here? Since stomach loses the capacity or property of distensibility here, the most common symptom is early satiety. So most common symptom is early satiety. Now see, carcinoma stomach can involve lymph nodes. There is hematogenous spread and it can involve various organs in the body. Now see, depending upon the involvement, one by one. First, involvement of left axilla lymph node in carcinoma stomach is known as Irish nodes. Next, involvement of left supraclavicular lymph node. This is known as Virchow's node. And the name of this sign is known as Troisier's sign. Involvement of left supraclavicular lymph node is Troisier's sign. After that, there is cutaneous metastatic deposit. Cutaneous metastatic deposit around umbilicus. And this is known as Sister Mary Joseph nodes. Be careful, it's not the lymph node, it's the cutaneous metastatic deposit. After that, there is palpable intraperitoneal palpable intraperitoneal metastasis on digital rectal examination and this is known as Blummer's shelf palpable intraperitoneal metastasis on digital rectal examination known as Blummer shelf and sometimes there is involvement of bilateral ovary in carcinoma stomach known as Krukenberg tumor. So the simple question is asked involvement of bilateral ovary in carcinoma stomach occurs by which route? So there are multiple routes which are involved first transcelomic or transperitoneal second hematogenous and third retrograde lymphatic according to old concept according to old concept most common route was transcelomic or transperitoneal. But see, nowadays, most common route is retrograde lymphatic. See, all these are the routes. Out of this, nowadays, concept has been changed. And the most common route is what? Retrograde lymphatic spread. Clear? After that, have a look. What happens? Investigation of choice for diagnosis of carcinoma stomach. Obviously, endoscopy plus biopsy. Investigation of choice for diagnosis is endoscopy with biopsy. And investigation of choice for staging is, I told you, endoscopic ultrasound. And best investigation for preoperative staging. For preoperative staging, yes, best investigation is CCT. So, this is how we are going to diagnose the malignancy. This is how we are going to stage the malignancy. Now, we are going to discuss 8th AJCC TNM classification for carcinoma stomach. So, have a look. 8th 
AJCC TNM classification for carcinoma stomach. First, TIS. TIS is carcinoma in C2 or high grade dysplasia. After that, T1A, tumor invades. Lemina propria, or muscularis mucosa, after that T1B, tumor invades submucosa, after that T2 Tumor invades muscularis propria After that T3 this is important T3 tumor penetrates subserosal Connective tissue without invasion of visceral peritoneum or adjacent structures. Clear? So, tumor penetrates subserosal connective tissue without invasion of visceral peritoneum or adjacent structure. Now, have a look what happens in T4A. There is invasion of a tumor invades serosa or visceral peritoneum. Now what happens in T4B, tumor invades adjacent structures. Tumor invades adjacent structures. So this is very important. T. After that, second thing which is very important is lymph node or N. In N, N1. Metastasis to one to two regional lymph nodes and two in this metastasis to three to six regional lymph node. After that, N three A there is metastasis to 7 to 15 regional lymph nodes and N3B. There is metastasis to 16 or more regional lymph nodes. See, it's very important. The TNM classification for carcinoma stomach is very, very important. So, this is TNM. M is easy. M0, no metastasis. And M1 is metastasis. So, this is TNM classification. Now, going to start very, very important topic that is GIST. So, what is the full form of GIST? Gastrointestinal stromal tumor. So now there is a simple concept, you know that there is carcinoma and there is sarcoma. Carcinomas are having what epithelial origin and sarcomas are having what mesenchymal or stromal origin. So can you see, this tumor will behave like carcinoma or sarcoma, be careful, 
the most of properties of this tumor will be like sarcoma. Can you see the gastrointestinal stromal tumor? So the origin is from stroma. This is most common mesenchymal, most common gastrointestinal mesenchymal tumor. What is the most common site? Most common site is stomach followed by small intestine followed by colorectum which is almost equal to esophagus. What is the origin of this tumor? It arises from gastric pacemaker cell. And what is that gastric pacemaker cell? That is interstitial cells of Kajal. You know that this tumor express tyrosine kinase receptor. The name of that tyrosine kinase receptor is C kit. This C kit is going to express one marker, and the name of that marker is CD117. Apart from CD117, there is expression of BCL2, CD34, and PDGFRA. What is this PDGFRA? It is platelet derived growth factor receptor alpha. Have a look. It is platelet derived growth factor receptor alpha. It is usually expressed by 5% of gist. And be careful, the gist which is going to express PDGFRA is having favorable prognosis and low risk of recurrence. Favorable prognosis and low risk of recurrence. There are two new markers which are frequently asked in exam. One is new markers dog 1 and second is protein kinase C theta. Dog 1 and protein kinase C theta. These are two new tumor markers which are frequently asked nowadays in exam. Full form of dog 1 is discovered on just one so this is dog one these are two new tumor markers lots of questions are also asked in pathology it is of two types first spindle cell and second epithelioid Most common type is spindle cell 70% and epithelioid is 30%. Now see, what are the differences of this tumor from adenocarcinoma which we discussed just now. Have a look. This is carcinoma stomach or adenocarcinoma. What kind of growth was there in carcinoma stomach or adenocarcinoma? Can you see? Intraluminal growth. Now you can see gist. And can you see what kind of growth is seen in gist? This kind of growth is seen. What? Extra luminal or extra mural. This kind of growth. Can you see? The tumor is highly vascular. And since tumor is highly vascular, what is the most common presentation? It's bleeding, sometimes with abdominal pain. It means the patients of carcinoma stomach are symptomatic at early stage, whereas these patients are symptomatic in advanced stage. So clinical features, most common presentation, is bleeding and abdominal pain. I told you that it will behave like sarcoma and you know in sarcoma usually there is hematogenous spread only. That's why in this case also there is only hematogenous spread. If there is only hematogenous spread, there is no involvement of what? Lymphatic spread or lymph nodes. And that's why because of hematogenous spread here, most common site of metastasis is what? Liver.
so it is associated with hematogenous spread only it is not associated with lymphatic spread and that's why there is no lymph node metastasis most common site of metastasis is obviously liver one question which is frequently asked and that is what carnies tried what are the components of this carnies tried first multifocal gist second pulmonary chondroma and third extra adrenal paraganglioma pulmonary chondroma and extra adrenal paraganglioma these are the components of carney stride here since the growth of this tumor is extra luminal or extra mural the investigation of choice for diagnosis is cct so investigation of choice for diagnosis is cct and one question which is frequently asked what gold standard investigation for diagnosis of recurrent cyst gold standard investigation for diagnosis of recurrent cyst that's pet ct it's pet ct so diagnosis is done after that we have to treat it now be careful if this patient is having resectable tumor in cases of resectable tumor can you see wedge shaped excision is done with 2 cm margin so this is segmental resection in cases of just segmental resection or wedge shaped excision with 2 cm margin is done now sometimes what happens at the time of presentation the malignancy is invading transverse colon sometimes spleen sometimes kidney also and this is unresectable just in cases of unresectable just what's the drug of choice drug of choice for unresectable just and that is imatinib imatinib mesylate second question suppose we are monitoring the response of therapy to imatinib how we are going to monitor monitoring of response of imatinib is done by pet scan so what on pet scan i found that the tumor is not responding to imatinib in that case what is the drug of choice sunitinib so drug of choice for imatinib resistant gist drug of choice for imatinib resistant gist and that is sunitinib so after imatinib or sunitinib the tumor will become resectable and then we have to resect it so this is how we are going to manage the patients of gist which is very very important after that there are other important conditions first congenital hypertrophic pyloric stenosis congenital hypertrophic pyloric stenosis first question it is congenital or acquired be careful it's acquired that's why its name has been changed and now the name is what 
IHPS. IHPS is infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. Now have a look. It is characterized by hypertrophy of circular muscle fibers at pylorus. Now have a look. What's the problem in this case? This is the problem. This is the stomach. This is the pylorus. Near pylorus, there is hypertrophy of the muscle fibers. And because of this hypertrophy, can you see? There is obstruction. Now, it is acquired. It means the child is normal at the time of birth. What is the incidence? 1 in 3000 to 4000 live births. And you know, it is more common in males and first-born males are most commonly affected. First-born males are most commonly affected. Since child is normal at the time of birth, at what age patient presents? Its patient presents at 4th to 6th week after birth. Clear? So, after 4 to 6 week of birth, patient is having symptoms. What is the problem? Can you see? After breastfeeding, can you see? After breastfeeding, what happens? This breast milk is going to collect in stomach. And since there is obstruction because of hypertrophy of circular muscle fibers, this patient is having multiple episodes of non bilious vomiting which can be projectile or non projectile so what is the presentation patient is having multiple episodes of non bilious projectile or non projectile vomiting clear now see Immediately, patient is rushed to the hospital and see what are the examination findings. There is multiple episodes of non-bilious projectile or non-projectile vomiting. Can you see? This is the obstruction because of hypertrophy of circular muscle fibers. Now, what will happen? This is the abdomen. On examination, we are going to find a mass or palpable olive and where is this mass or palpable olive in the epigastrium usually in the epigastrium sometimes in right hypochondrium so there is palpable mass or olive now can you see since there is obstruction this is the direction of peristalsis in the stomach so what is the direction of peristalsis Direction of peristalsis is from left to right. So, on examination, palpable mass or olive in epigastrium and direction of peristalsis from left to right is highly suggestive of infantile hypertrophic pyloric stenosis. It means an experienced clinician can easily confirm the diagnosis on the basis of clinical presentation and on the basis of examination findings. That is palpable mass or olive with direction of peristalsis from left to right. But suppose if you want to confirm the diagnosis, investigation of choice for diagnosis is ultrasound. Nowadays, lots of questions are asked about the criteria of diagnosis on ultrasound. Have a look. This is pyloric muscle thickness or hypertrophic. Pyloric stenosis on ultrasound. Have a look. 
this pyloric muscle thickness should be more than 4 mm this channel length should be more than 16 mm and this transverse diameter should be more than 13 mm so there are three criteria i'm going to write again the three criteria are first pyloric muscle thickness should be more than 4 mm second channel length should be more than 16 mm and third transverse diameter should be more than 13 mm this is the investigation of choice now see if i'm going for plain x-ray on plain x-ray what is the finding can you see this is the x-ray on x-ray this is the finding what is this finding you can see the stomach filled with air and this is known as single bubble so there is single bubble appearance if i'm going for barium meal we can confirm the diagnosis also what are the various signs on barium meal there is string sign there is shoulder sign and there is double track sign string sign shoulder sign and double track sign on barium meal now one question which is frequently asked that what is the kind of dyselectrolytemia seen in patients of hypertrophic pyloric stenosis it's very easy have a look this is stomach what's there in stomach hcl and there is mucus in that potassium is there because of repeated vomiting what happens there is hypokalemia because there is loss of potassium, there is hypochloremia and there is metabolic alkalosis because there is loss of H plus or proton. Whenever kidney is going to sense metabolic alkalosis, can you see in the collecting duct of kidney, there is a exchanger. That exchanger is known as sodium proton exchanger initially what happens this proton is preserved and sodium is excreted but what will happen there is vomiting and here in urine there is loss of sodium which takes too much of water also now kidney will sense severe hypovolemia or hyponatremia after that kidney reverses its function it starts preserving sodium and it starts excreting h plus because of excretion of H plus in urine, this is known as what? Paradoxical aciduria. So, what is that characteristic dyselectrolytemia? Hypokalemia, hypochloremia, metabolic alkalosis, paradoxical aciduria. Be careful. This is a medical emergency or surgical emergency. This is a medical emergency. And that's why, first, we have to resuscitate the patient by fluids. We have to correct dyselectrolytemia, and then only we are going to take the patient for surgery. So it's a kind of medical emergency. That's why. What's the treatment? Treatment is resuscitation by. IV fluids and correction of dyselectrolytemia. Correction of dyselectrolytemia. Be careful. Fluid of choice is normal saline. This is frequently asked in exam. Fluid of choice in hypertrophic pyloric stenosis is normal saline. After resuscitation, what's the treatment of choice? That is Ramstead. 
free debt. Piloro myotomy. Ramstead free debt piloro myotomy. Be careful. Usually it is performed by open approach, but nowadays even laparoscopic Ramstead free debt piloro myotomy is performed. So this is the treatment of choice.